Good evening. Welcome to Scotland at Seven. My name is Sean Peeper, and my guest this evening is Maureen Watt, former member of the Scottish Parliament from 2006 until 2021, holder of multiple ministerial positions during that time, and also, very importantly, the first member of the Parliament to take her oath in Doric. Welcome to the programme, Maureen. Aye, aye, Sean. How are you doing? <laughs> Thank you. Now, we begin this evening with our updates from the conflict zones in Ukraine and Gaza. It's day 777 of the war in Ukraine. David Cameron's attempts to persuade Donald Trump to permit the US Congress to push through $60 billion of military aid for Ukraine appears to have failed after the UK Foreign Secretary was not even granted a meeting with Congressional Speaker Mike Johnson, who could, in theory, put the package to a vote. Johnson instead found himself assailed by hard-right Georgia Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, who renewed her threats of a snap vote to remove him from office for even countenancing a vote. At a private dinner at Trump's Florida base, the Mar-a-Lago estate, Cameron had urged the former president to recognise that it was in the US's interest that Vladimir Putin not be rewarded for seizing territory from Ukraine. He also insisted that, by the time of a NATO summit in Washington this July, plans would be in place for every NATO member to reach or pass the target of defence spending. Cameron was hoping Trump would signal a change of course, at least by easing the path to him meeting Johnson, but this overture, however, appears to have been ignored. Russia has claimed that Ukraine attacked the now Russian-controlled Zaporizhia nuclear plant for a third day in a row with drones. However, Ukrainian officials have denied that Kiev had anything to do with the attacks. Ukraine has denied it is behind a series of drone attacks on the plant over the past three days, including three on Sunday, which the International Atomic Energy Agency said had endangered nuclear safety. The recent drone fell onto the roof of the building, the training centre specifically, and no one was consequently injured. Meanwhile, Chinese leader Xi Jinping has met with Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, pardon me, Sergei Lavrov on Tuesday. Earlier, Lavrov met China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi to underline the friendly relationship between Moscow and Beijing. The two sides agreed to start a dialogue on Eurasian security and to continue to cooperate in the fight against terrorism in the wake of the devastating attack in Moscow. Three people, meanwhile, were killed in the Russian-controlled part of Ukraine's southern Kherson region by Ukrainian shelling on Monday, the Russian-installed regional head, Vladimir Saldo, has said. Ukraine's military spy agency, the GUR, struck a main production facility of a Russian aviation factory in Voronezh region, a Ukrainian intelligence source is reported to have said. Meanwhile, Ukraine's air defence systems have destroyed all 20 attacking drones that Russia launched targeting Ukraine. Ukrainian Air Force commander Mykola Oleschuk said on Tuesday, the drones were destroyed in the Mykolaiv, Odessa, Kherson, Dnipropetrovsk, Poltava, Vinitsia and Lviv regions, Oleschuk has said. A Ukraine-launched anti-ship Neptune missile was also destroyed over the Black Sea, while four drones were downed over the Belograd and Voronezh regions, the Russian Ministry of Defence has said on Tuesday. While an extraordinary meeting of the UN nuclear watchdog's 35-nation Board of Governors called by Russia to discuss the attacks on the Zaporizhia plant is due to be held on Thursday, three diplomats have said. The International Atomic Energy Agency has, however, yet to announce the date of the meeting. Now we turn to the situation in Gaza, where at least 33,482 Palestinians have been killed and 76,049 have been injured in Israeli strikes since the 7th of October, according to the latest figures from the Gaza Health Ministry. It also said that 122 Palestinians were killed and 56 injured, in Israeli strikes within the past 24 hours. Eid al-Fatr was observed by Muslims across the world today 
including in Gaza, where Eid prayers were held outside the ruins of a mosque in Rafa to mark the end of the holy month of Ramadan. President Biden said Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's approach on Gaza was, quote, a mistake and urged Israel to call for a ceasefire in an interview that aired on Tuesday. While Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez warned today that Israel's, quote, disproportionate response in the Gaza war with Hamas risks destabilizing the Middle East and, as a consequence, the entire world. Israel said it was moving aid into Gaza more quickly as a result of international pressure. However, these figures have been disputed. Israel said that 468 aid trucks were moved into Gaza on Tuesday, the highest since the conflict began. However, the Red Crescent and UN have given much lower figures, with the UN saying many trucks were only half full because of Israeli inspection rules. Iran's Supreme Leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, today reiterated a promise to retaliate against Israel over the killings of Iranian generals in Syria. Israel's foreign minister has threatened that Israeli forces would strike Iran directly if the Islamic Republic launched an attack from its territory against Israel. UK Foreign Secretary David Cameron has confirmed that the government will not suspend arms exports to, ex to Israel after the killing of seven aid workers in an airstrike on Gaza last week. A vigil for the more than 100 people who remain unaccounted for after being kidnapped by Hamas in October also took place in central London on Tuesday. The commander of the UN peacekeeping mission in Lebanon, Araldo Lazaro, has today warned that the danger of escalation on the border is very real. While Israel has also agreed in ceasefire talks in Egypt, to potential concessions regarding the return of Palestinians to the north of Gaza, but has said that it believes Hamas does not want to strike a deal. According to the UN, 95% of pregnant and breastfeeding women in Gaza are not getting adequate food or nutrition, a situation which also applies to young children. Palestine's ambassador to Ireland has welcomed Dublin's promise to formally recognise Palestinian statehood and hoped that other EU members would follow suit. While the World Health Organisation teams arrived at the Al Shifa Hospital in northern Gaza on Monday to help identify bodies within the ruins. Mossad Ansala, director of the Gaza Emergency Operations Centre, told AFP that the scenes on Monday at the sprawling medical centre were, quote, unbearable. Now, Maureen, turning to you, this one word, quote, unbearable, I think that can be applied uh, to this situation generally, but very strikingly, the fact that uh, the government now has its position. It has no intention of limiting or pausing or restricting arms sales to Israel, which uh, in the future will, will leave the UK government in position of potential legal action, potential action at the International Court of Justice uh, and the International Criminal Court. Um, and I really just would quite like your reaction to how this could, offend, uh, could, uh, could snowball ultimately, uh, how this could contribute to uh, really uncomfortable problems for the British government further down the line. Well, I think David Cameron's intervention and in saying this is um, very unhelpful, although not unpredictable. Um, you know, I'm sure that Stephen, as we know, Stephen Flynn, the leader of the SNP group at Westminster, has called for a recall uh, last week of the um, of the UK Parliament in order. Um, to debate Gaza further and I suspect that any motion that would be put forward was particularly about arms sales. I hope um, that efforts to have that debate still go ahead. I think it's important um, that this this is a very important issue and must be debated um, in the Westminster Parliament and David Cameron in my view has no right to um, jump the gun on this and try and 
head it off at the pass, so to speak. So um, I really, as I say, do hope that this is debated further in, in the at, at Westminster. Um, I think there will be repercussions further down the line, but I think further down the line is a long way off and we probably will have a new government in post um, by that time. Um, but the whole issue of uh, arms sales, as I think I mentioned the last time I was on Broadcasting Scotland, is really fraught um, with difficulty. Um, and um, while you know you can call for um, arms sales to be halted, uh, I think we know now that most arms dealers and companies have ways of getting round uh, direct sales to Israel, but through third world, through third countries, not third world countries, but third countries, um, and um, that in itself is not going to bring about peace at the. Um, arms sales can be filled from from other countries very quickly. That's a very um, so that's a very I'm good not, point. I'm yes, not, you know, I'm not condoning the arms sales in any way whatsoever. Um, I think there's a you know a whole big international debate to be had on that. Um, but yeah, I think you know I do hope this is brought up next week when uh, Parliament resumes. Absolutely. Now moving on. Uh, research has revealed that the Chancellor's budget will ultimately see Canary Wharf in London receive additional funding of over £16,000 per person, higher than the level of spending in Scotland. This research, which has been carried out by the SNP, shows that as a result of the announcements made in the UK government's 2024 spring budget, Scotland, with a population of 5.5 million, will receive £295 million pounds through Barnet Consequentials, which works out at approximately £54 pounds per person. The Chancellor announced £118 million pounds worth of investment for Canary Wharf, which has a resident population of 7,076, which works out at about £16,700 per person, 16646 more in addition to the funding per head in Scotland. Commenting, the SNP's levelling up spokesperson, Anum Kaisar MP, said, well, Westminster's priorities are clear for us all to see, and Scotland isn't one of them in this broken Brexit Britain. Scotland has been dragged out of the EU against our will. Our Scottish Parliament and its powers have been ignored and undermined, and our businesses and household budgets have been repeatedly hammered by Westminster's austerity, the cost of living crisis, and overall economic chaos. And now we see that London's Canary Wharf, host to some of the biggest banks in the world and their rich bankers, is receiving over £16,000 more per person than Scotland in additional funding. So that's quite a staggering number. I'm very much uh, immediately reminded of um, Boris Johnson's quote in 2012, where he made the statement that, you know, a pound spent in Croydon was of far more value than a pound spent in Strathclyde. However, it's also very, very worth pointing out, uh, Canary Wharf is not Croydon. You know, Canary Wharf is a, a, a sort of an exceptional, odd place within London. It does not reflect the life of uh, your ordinary Londoner either. Um, I sort of I question whether ultimately this is you know the epitaph of of Tory levelling up just the, the sheer the sheer inequality that is not just getting worse by accident but is actively fostered for uh, for economic interests. Yes, you wonder what exactly it's going to pay for in Canary Wharf. Uh, I mean, it's already um, a very rich area of London, and I remember when. Um, the Tory government scrapped HS2 immediately. Money from that was earmarked for that uh, was going to be spent. I think it was in Canary Wharf um, as well. So um, yes, it just highlights. And I hope this is widely, widely publicised because it just uh, epitomises the Tory government down to the ground. Michael Gove can say all he likes about levelling up, but he is um, superseded 
or uh, uh, rolled over by uh, others in the government who um, are putting money to where their pals in the city want it. You know, Scotland has got a thriving financial sector as well. Why don't they even give us some up in Edinburgh and the Glasgow uh, parts of the uh, financial world um, or, or send it to the Scottish government and we we'll, can decide ourselves whether we want to, to spend it in those areas of our cities. Um, but it's got absolutely nothing to do um, with levelling up and just shows how crass and, you know, just how awful this Westminster government is in terms of saying one thing um, and doing another and yet again using taxpayers' money uh, to help out their rich pals. Now, the SNP has also accused the UK government of failing the northeast of Scotland specifically after it was reported that only 35 civil service jobs have been created within Aberdeen, despite the UK promising hundreds. The news follows UK ministers announcing in December that thousands of UK government jobs would be relocated away from London, with hundreds moved to Aberdeen. Richard Thompson, MP for Gordon, has said this announcement represents, quote, one more broken Tory promise to Scotland's North East, with Westminster happy to squander Scotland's vast natural resources in order to prop up the books of the UK Treasury. Richard Thompson also said that, quote, the news that only 35 jobs will be created in Aberdeen, despite the government promising hundreds, is one more broken tom Tory promise in a now endless list. North East find itself at the forefront of the green energy renewables gold rush. But that potential can only be reached if the investment and jobs come with it. This is what we have come to expect from Westminster, who are happy to squander Scotland's vast natural resources in order to prop up the books of the Treasury. Thompson added further that there can be no doubt that Scotland's energy should be in Scotland's hands. We have the energy. We just need the power. Now, I think it's no it's no secret that the the current Tory government are not particularly wedded to the idea of this green energy revolution, of the potential of that, not just in the northeast of Scotland or Scotland generally, but all over the UK, all over the British Isles. Uh, there is potential for really transformative um, green energy investment. Um, so that's that, that's relatively apparent, I would say. I think the additional worry must surely come from the fact that Labour has now dropped its uh, sort of extensive uh, green energy investment plans, and it's not really clear what, if any, of that will be carried forward. Um, so that must be causing real sort of economic concern within the Northeast as well. The idea of not just not developing something, but actively missing fantastic opportunity which could uh, could be you know an absolute key part of this uh, sort of fair transition for for workers within the oil and gas sector uh, so so how what would you say in terms of you know the, the the sort of the Tory disregard for these kind of policies versus we're not quite sure where the Labour Party are at now well before I do that Sean I want to uh, tell you a story about why this is so difficult to get energy jobs, uh, civil service energy jobs up to Aberdeen. I remember being at a dinner at the on the eve of the um, biannual big um, uh, oil and gas um, exhibition uh, in Aberdeen one year and I was sitting at a table um, with the principal of one of Aberdeen's universities and also at the table was a, a young uh, Department of Energy uh, civil servant who had been <clears throat> born in the City of London, educated in the City of London at primary, secondary and university level and got a job with civil service in the, city, in the centre uh, of London. And honestly, really, he had jitters being in Aberdeen for perhaps a day or two for the energy conference. And that, I think, to me, epitomises the uh, civil service attitude to, towards jobs coming out of London 
um, and maybe particularly to the northeast of Scotland, which they see as the end of the earth. Um, but you're right to highlight the future and the green energy potential, because whereas um, the uh, problems and the transition to uh, green energy won't be uh, realised by um, people moving from the oil and gas industry into the green energy sector wholly, they, with the skills that they have, are ideally placed to make that transition happen. Um, and so it is imperative, in my view, that um, the civil service has a bigger presence urgently in the northeast in order for Aberdeen and the northeast to remain the all energy capital of Europe. Uh, I think that is really, really important if the whole of the UK currently and Scotland in the future in particular uh, is to remain uh, in that position. Um, and the urgency is absolutely there because decisions need to be made quickly, more quickly than they normally are through the bureaucracy of the UK government in order to expedite the transition uh, to green energy. But my story, I think, will highlight to you and the viewers what exactly the the, um, the Department of Energy um, and Green Energy or whatever it's called now um, and the kind of psyche of many, too many civil servants in the UK government hold. So, so what you're saying essentially, it's not just a, an economic issue, it's not just a, an issue of sort of uh, lack of lack of planning, it's actually a cultural issue and it likely yeah. goes far wider than than just this one instance. You know, we've seen uh, in recent years, you know, initiatives to try and push certain things out of London, you know, uh, whether it's the, you know, English Royal Opera, etc., various of these cultural institutions and how much they have just utterly pushed back against it. There is very little interest from within London to look outside of London. Um, Absolutely. And I think this is yeah. just another instance where it applies. I think, unfortunately, it's just it's tied to very serious future energy concerns in this instance. Yep. Now, Police Scotland has today issued data in relation to the introduction of the Hate Crime and Public Order Scotland Act 2021, which came into force on the 1st of April 2024. The management data shows that there were 7,152 online hate reports received from the 1st of April to the 7th of April 2024. During this period, subsequently, 240 hate crimes and 30 non-hate crime incidents were recorded. The vast majority of these reports were received during this period were anonymous. These were assessed against the new legislation and no further action is being taken in regard to them. A Police Scotland spokesperson said, quote, this data highlights the substantial increase in the number of online hate reports being received since the 1st of April. A significant demand continues to be managed within our contact centres and so far the impact on frontline policing, our ability to answer calls and respond to those who need our help in communities across Scotland has been minimal. Quote, All complaints received are reviewed by officers, supported by dedicated hate crime advisors and dealt with appropriately, whether that is being progressed for further assessment or closed as they do not meet the criteria under the legislation. Responding to the statement, the Justice Secretary, Andrew Constance, said, These statistics show that of the significant number of online hate crime reports made to Police Scotland since the 1st of April, almost half came in on the day that the new legislation commenced, with the number of daily complaints falling by 90% within the first week. These comparison statistics show how vital tackling hate crime is, and how it is not a new issue for Scotland's police and justice system. I want to thank police, staff and officers for their dedication and professionalism in their work as this law came into force, and for all that they do, day in, day out, to keep our communities safe. So overall, 7,152 online reports um, 
dropping by 90% the next day. Um, I suspect this might, to some extent, be a storm in a teacup, uh, particularly as we see more information of actually coordinated campaigns, not even from within Scotland, attempting to flood and overwhelm the, the hate crime legislation reporting system. Um, however, what we do also see is that is this being backed up in uh, the media in the UK. We see this being echoed by politicians trying to make out that Scotland's hate crime law is somehow you know, vastly different to within the rest of the UK, which uh, it is not, in fact. You know, there are, there are, there's very little difference between the systems. So, you know, I wonder, though, can, can the, the, I think the attempts to spin the hate, claim, the hate crime legislation, sorry, into something, uh, something bigger than it is, a bigger change than it actually, in fact, is, uh, I'm just, I'm immediately reminded of the reaction and misinformation, ultimately, with uh, regards to the GRR bill. You know, something that was, in effect, a small administrative change that suddenly became, you know, the focal point of a culture war and Scotland is somehow doing something ridiculous when, in fact, you know, look around the world, look at all the other countries that have equivalent legislation to this. Yes, you're absolutely right, Sean. I mean, as you say, it's yet another onslaught by the opponents of the uh, Scottish government and the SNP who um, can see that they're on the whole doing a good job and that the support for independence is rising. Um, but yet they want to, by fair means or foul, completely discredit uh, the UK government and the Scottish National Party. Um, in terms of this specific piece of legislation, yeah, it was obvious that thousands of thousands of people were waiting to press uh, the button to register um, a, a hate crime incident. The fact that the vast majority were anonymous, um, you know, I don't know what the instructions to the police are, but if they're anom anonymous, then, you know, I wouldn't deal with them at all because how can you follow them up? But I hope in this um, vast majority, uh, in this, in the among these thousands of um, emails or whatever that the Police Scotland have uh, received, that genuine ones um, aren't missed. And I hope that people who have registered um, a, a clear hate crime in their name or in the name of somebody that it can be followed up. Um, will re-report it if they do not um, get a reply. But yes, I think this is just mischievous, mischie uh, mischievous um, uh, actions on behalf of the Scottish government's opponents. And I hope it will die down. Um, I wonder what they'll move on to next to have an onslaught um, against the SNP government. But in my nearly 50 years uh, next month of being in the SNP. Um, I've never, ever seen such uh, malicious, malevolent behaviour from the opposition um, in a democratic government and a democratic parliament. Well, speaking of the democratic process, the SNP has today announced the appointment of Stuart Hosey MP as the party's campaign director for the upcoming Westminster election. This news comes as the party confirmed its final candidates, making the SNP the only political party to have candidates in place in each of Scotland's 57 constituencies. Mr Hosey, an MP since 2005, joined the SNP in 1983 and has held a number of party posts, including becoming the first ever youth convener, spending three years as the party's national secretary, and serving as the party's deputy leader for two years. Mr Hosey said, I am thrilled and honoured to be invited to lead our election charge, and I can't wait to get stuck in. Taking the SNP's positive message, the door steps the length and breadth of Scotland. The SNP is the only party ready and raring to go. Like people across Scotland, we want to get the Tories out of number 10 as soon as possible. They have inflicted more than a decade of suffering on Scotland 
and Labour is offering no hope of real change from the same failed right-wing agenda that delivered broken Brexit Britain. Scotland deserves better, and the SNP is the only party offering a brighter future with independence. End quote. Commenting, the SNP leader, Humza Yousaf, said, quote, I'm sure the whole party will welcome the news that SNP stalwart Stuart Hosey has accepted my invitation to be campaign director for the upcoming Westminster election. Stuart brings an unrivaled wealth of experience and expertise to the role, and I have no doubt he will lead the delivery of a fantastic campaign. So in relation to the election, obviously, I think it's quite apparent that from the point of view of the, the Conservatives, they, they have laid their terrain for this election and it is going to be, you know, all culture wars, you know, which whichever it may be that they think are the most, uh, give them the most leverage in that moment. But that, that is sort of the hand that they are left holding. Uh, however, the question then is what we have seen so far coming from um, from the Labour opposition is actually they don't seem to ha be holding any cards either. So what we're actually getting is, by default, an election dynamic built around culture wars, which you know I find quite a concerning dynamic to be evolving further and further, leading to division, polarisation, and the real risk of, of violence as well. Um, so I, I sort of would like your, your thoughts in terms of how, how does the SNP tread a sort of positive line in this sort of an environment obviously you know positive while also being realistic being pragmatic all the rest of it but you know it really just in stark contrast to how utterly divisive these culture war issues are becoming in the context of electoral politics yes i mean i welcome uh stuart hosey um joining the um campaign team um at HQ level for uh, the Westminster election. Uh, he's uh, a, a, a veteran campaigner, if you like, and because he's not standing himself again, he'll be give, able to give it his utmost attention. Um, and I think he'll be uh, really good at it. In terms of yeah, the election, uh, the way the election is going to be uh, fought um i agree with you about the culture wars issue um and i think it's even more realistic as you say because labor seem to be all over the place the tories have um no problem in stealing labor party policies on the way we've seen that um with the taxation of non-doms um and i think that is likely to continue in their desperation uh, to hold on to power, which, by the way, I doubt will be uh, successful. But it does mean that the election will be uh, dirty and in the gutter. And I think the SNP have a record of uh, fighting elections on positivity, sometimes much to uh, the dismay of um, some of us, I think, who thought, who think that we should retaliate sometimes on the nonsense um, that is said about uh, the SNP and we should uh, call them out, uh, our opposition out um, a bit more. And I think it's really important this time, you know, to highlight that we've had so many prime ministers uh, since 2010 and however many we've had in the last uh, five years of this parliament, is it three or four? Um, so. Um, That'd be four. Yes, uh, it, it's interesting to, uh, on your take on it, and I would broadly agree. Well, that's the thing, as you said. You know, I, I don't think there there is much potential for uh, for the Tories to stay in power, but they can simply choose the ground that the election is fought on if they manage to sort of just um, utterly saturate it with culture wars. The ironic thing being that when you actually poll voters. Uh, they're utterly fed up with this kind of rhetoric. Nobody enjoys being riled up, enjoys being, you know, pitted against their neighbour or their family or whatever. But, you know, it's a good way of finding the sort of the, the pressure issue in that way, which which can kind of help sway uh, sway opinion. 
Uh, speaking yeah, and, of, and, sorry. Sorry, on you go. <laughs> no, no, please, please continue. I was going to move on. Um, yeah, and, and you see it day in, day out. I mean, the pile on on Angela Rayner uh, for something that happened before she even became a, an MP is absolutely disgraceful, utterly, utterly disgraceful. And the fact that um, not just, you know, some of the press, but all of the press and the media even insist on on bringing it up on, you know, press preview or things like that. It's just absolutely awful. Um, so I think we're going to see a lot more of that kind of dirty linen thrown um, at opposition members and candidates um, during the election to try and discredit. But one other thing that I wanted to say is that clearly the Tories are riled by um, what they see or perceive as um, a threat from the further right than they are, the Reform uh, UK party. And well, um, I think polling shows that they're not likely to um, win any seats. They can certainly take enough votes to stop the Tories uh, retaining uh, their seats and Labour gaining them. So um, I think that's in the Tory in Tories' minds as well as they formulate their um, absolutely. Absolutely. Their program for fighting the election, and again the the risk there for the uh, for the rest of the electorate being that you know the last time the Tories were in that situation where they they were concerned they were being outflanked on the right by UKIP led us to the Brexit referendum. Mm. So yeah. that that is a real you know assuming that the next UK government will be a Labour government, it's always it's the concern of what state will right-wing politics then progress in while in opposition? What will it be able to sort of uh, hand wave away as the fault of a supposedly left-wing government in power? And I think that we can't, the fact that we can't expect any fairness um, from the mainstream media um, not just um, the SNP, that's a given, um, but Labour as well, um, and or anybody anti-Tory or right wing is not going to get a fair shout, um, I think is really worrying as well. So, But I think that's where that the SNP can um, score advantage because we have such a lot of activists who are willing to pound the streets, either delivering leaflets and letters to, um, or, or or knocking on doors and speaking to people. Um, and I think that's going to be even more important than in this election um, than any others. Of course, how our leaders do on debates might influence some people, although um, I think if you speak to John Curtis, a lot of people will have made up their minds um, before now anyway. And there are such a lot of seats um, that are more marginal than they would have been at any other time because of the slump in Tory support. Um, you know, there's a limited amount of activists in every party and they're going to be further spread if, for example, the Labour Party are hoping to, to gain a vast number of seats. So um, it's all going to be <laughs> quite exciting when the time comes, I think, the short campaign, well, which staying, can't be as Staying, staying on the soon. subject, uh, sorry, staying on the subject of um, Labour's preparations for the election, um, Sir Keir Starmer has now officially ruled out a future Labour government returning the UK to any form of customs union with the European Union. The Labour Party rejected this possibility, um, according to a report in the Financial Times. The denial follows Labour's shadow cabinet office minister, Nick Thomas-Simons, saying that Labour, quote, are committed to making Brexit work. Alan Smith MP, the SNP's Europe and EU accession spokesperson, has said that the Labour leader's, quote, refusal to accept the economic vandalism that is Brexit will continue to hammer households and businesses. Commenting further, Smith said, poll after poll shows that the people of Scotland want to rejoin the EU and the world's largest single market at the earliest opportunity, after being dragged out by Westminster against their will. And yet, despite this, Sir Keir Starmer has confirmed that an incoming Labour government will remain focused on preserving the Tories' failed Brexit Britain economic model, signalling once again 
that the views of the Scottish people mean nothing to him. Starmer's refusal to accept the economic vandalism of Brexit will continue to hammer households and businesses in Scotland. End quote. Now that's certainly not massively surprising. That's not a, a change of policy from Labour. They've not uh, been making out as though they had any intentions of really sort of strongly pushing um, a sort of a closer alignment with the EU, although they had been hinting that this was potentially still on the table. Um, now, is, is this straightforwardly just, is this electioneering towards the Red Wall at everyone else's expense? You know, Brexit, such as it is, has never been more unpopular in the UK. Uh, you know, a significant majority across the UK would vote to rejoin the EU or to remain in the EU in the first place if it were posed to them. Um, but yeah, the, is, is this simply trying to win those votes back in the north of England in the constituencies that were so heavily Brexit supporting? Yes, I think it must be. And, you know, uh, um, you know, when I talk to people in England um, who um, are Labour supporters of old, um, they are in utter despair that they really have no choice but um, right wing, further right wing and very right wing in terms of who they can vote for um, at this election. And it's purely um, what Labour Party pollsters must be telling them um, that they have to go right wing in order to regain these red wall seats. Um, in the meantime, anybody else who wants to see a Labour Party of old that uh, believes in social justice um, is left wondering whether to vote at all or how to vote because, um, you know, there is no rolling back, for example, of the to child limit or anything that you would really want to see. And that's why I think that come the time of the election, people in Scotland are going to say, you know, is this really the type of Labour government I want? Um, and since they're going to, you know, apparently win so many seats in Scotland, should we have a strong SNP contingent in Westminster in order to, to hold their feet to the fire in terms of some of the uh, more just social policies um, that we would like to see coming from a new government. Absolutely. Now, in Arizona, only hours after the Supreme Court declared on Tuesday that a 160-year-old abortion ban is now enforceable, Republicans in the state took a surprising stance for a party that has historically championed abortion restrictions and denounced the decision. Quote, this decision cannot stand, said Matt Grease, a Republican state representative. I categorically reject rolling back the clock to a time when slavery was still legal and we could lock up women and doctors because of an abortion. First passed when Arizona was still a territory, the ban only permits abortions to save a patient's life does not have exceptions for rape or incest. TJ Shope, a Republican state senator, said, quote, Today's Arizona Supreme Court decision reinstating an Arizona territorial era ban on all abortions from more than 150 years ago is disappointing to say the least. Carrie Lake, a Republican running to represent Arizona in the US Senate and a Donald Trump loyalist, also spoke up to oppose the ruling. Lake called on the state legislature to, quote, come up with an immediate common sense solution that Arizonans can support. Since the US Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, the Republican Party has stumbled in the 2022 midterms, and abortion rights supporters have won a string of ballot measures, including in undecided and Republican-run states, such as, I uh, such as Ohio, sorry. Republicans now struggle to find a way to talk about abortion without alienating their voters. But the response to the ruling on the 1864 ban may mark their fastest and strongest rebuke of abortion bans since Roe itself fell. The 1864 ban is not currently in effect and may not go into effect for weeks, 
due to legal delays. Abortion is currently allowed in Arizona up until 15 weeks of pregnancy. Arizona is one of roughly a dozen states where voters may be able to directly decide abortion rights come November. Activists in the state have now collected more than half a million signatures in favour of giving Arizona residents a chance to vote on a ballot measure that would enshrine abortion rights into the state's constitution. Democrats hope that the turnout for this proposal, which has yet to be officially added to the ballot, will also lead to a surge in support for their candidates, including the Democratic presidential candidate, Joe Biden. Now, former President Trump has certainly made it clear that in instances like this, were he to uh, retake the presidency in November this year, he would be absolutely empowering state legislators, the state Supreme Courts, uh, to, to make their own decisions on abortion. Uh, you know, he very much using the language of, of states' rights uh, in this instance, you know, trying to, again, as, as, um, as is clear here, you know, Republicans are seeing that while, part, you know, their base loves this kind of action, this kind of rhetoric, and these kind of laws, undecided voters, independent voters, and even simply the more moderate right, is this is not popular. Um, but so as a way of sort of trying to, to appease both sides of this. Uh, however, what we are also seeing is, I think, more, at least, perhaps not more, but certainly louder anti-abortion voices, both in the UK more broadly and here in Scotland, obviously epitomised by the, the controversial protests outside the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. Uh, it's been shown that obviously a significant amount of the both the sort of the, the materials, uh, the the ways of engaging people by, uh, connected to these groups, but also actually the financing of these groups comes directly from evangelical groups in the US who are seeking to get abortion clinics in other countries closed and ultimately to make abortion illegal in countries like the UK. And with the UK being seen as sort of their first target with the United States. So... What, what extent do you think that we could in the future be facing a sort of um, a US-funded culture war surrounding abortion here in Scotland or in the UK more generally? Well, um, I think we already are to some extent with the demonstrations, as you said, outside um, abortion clinics in uh, Scotland and um, the dire need for the legislation to come quickly on um, banning these groups who intimidate uh, women as they go uh, to visit these clinics. But in terms of the United States, you know, it seems to me states' rights against women's rights um, and the huge influence that Donald Trump and his coterie have throughout uh, Republicans um, in the United States and you know where they have had um, ballots on whether abortion rights should be changed in states I think I'm right in saying that mostly those in favor of retaining women's rights have won um, so it's really important um, where there is a, a groundswell of opinion and uh, registration of people wanting uh, a vote on this that it happens um, because all this is is putting women back in their box um, from a narcissistic um, president who wishes to be president um, again and we should never forget that and it's not just women who are want to see um, equality continue uh, and be embedded, but it's also very many men who want to see that and not to have the US and then maybe subsequently the UK go back into the dark ages. Well, absolutely. You know, the, the questions of abortion are rightly framed, uh, first and foremost, as an issue of, of women's rights, of women's bodily autonomy. But absolutely, it is a, a, an issue utterly crucial to men. Yeah. So to finish off um, this evening, 
the Scottish Government has announced a programme to help families during the school holidays. This joint initiative between the Scottish Government and the Scottish Football Association is supporting low-income families. Launched by the First Minister with a £2 million Scottish Government investment last year, the programme provides before school, after school and holiday activities for around 2,700 children each week. The Extra Time programme aims to tackle poverty by delivering accessible and affordable activity clubs for children from low-income families. During a visit to Dundee United Sports Club, which received £95,000 from the fund and provides support during term time and the school holidays, Deputy First Minister Shona Robinson said, quote, Scotland currently has one of the most generous childcare offers in the UK and our investment in early learning and childcare and school aged childcare is a key part of our goal to tackle child poverty. We are committed to building a system of school aged childcare that helps to support parents and carers into employment, training or study. Our investment is helping to reduce inequalities that exist for children from lower income families who might otherwise struggle to participate in activities before or after school or during the holidays. Our extra time partnership with the Scottish Football Association is in the early stages of delivery, but we are already seeing the positive impacts that access to term time and holiday clubs are having on both children and parents. Chief Executive of the Scottish Football Association, Ian Maxwell, said, quote, It's fantastic to see the impact this vital programme is already having across the country since its launch last year, building on the initial success of the pilot in air. I think it's great, Sean. Um, I've visited uh, the Football Trust at the Dons and at uh, Hibs uh, uh, Football Clubs and what they already do for um, other groups in society is fantastic. And I think uh, building on that, it's a, a nightmare uh, for parents um, who are having to watch how they spend every penny as to how they uh, keep their kids entertained uh, during holidays. And we've seen it most recently during these uh, Easter holidays. I just hope that um, the schemes are really targeted at those parents and families who are really struggling um, uh, rather than just um, anybody who um, wants to have their children entertained by somebody else uh, during the holidays. It must be really targeted on those families that are really struggling. But a great initiative um, for football, which sometimes get a bad, gets a bad name. But as I say, the community trusts are really doing some fantastic work. Well, absolutely. You know, this is not just a case of, oh, you know, a nice uh, holiday club to entertain the children. You know, the the impact on development, on uh, on achievement academically and, and on general well-being of both before, after school programmes and also uh, provision of activity and holidays is sort of is, is entirely clear. So, as you say, you know, this is not, you know, this is not some trivial thing. This is this can really be life changing for children, particularly children from the sort of lowest socioeconomic backgrounds who often struggle the most in terms of accessing just food in the context of education. Okay, well, that is it for this evening. Uh, before I go, I would just like to remind you that at Broadcasting Scotland, we depend on the generosity of our supporters. Our programmes will always be free to view. However, if you can afford donate five pounds per month please consider becoming a broadcasting scotland supporter to everyone who has donated and to everyone who has signed up to make a regular monthly payment thank you very much our focus must now move to securing the future of independent broadcasting for scotland by growing this subscriber base and increasing our regular funding thank you again to my guest for this evening maureen watt you're Bye. welcome, Sean. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Maureen. And goodbye, and thank you for watching. Good night.